Hello and welcome to my presentation on technological transformations, implications for the administration of adult and continuing education. My name is Kevin and I'm a student at the University of Regina's Master of Adult Education program. And this presentation is an assignment for EAHR 822, but it's also a reflection on many of the things I've been learning as I pursue my degree. In this presentation, I want to start by emphasizing the traditional role of the adult and continuing education administrator, briefly reviewing their functions and skills. And this will be important when we discuss technological change a little later in the presentation. I then want to briefly look at why students have chosen adult and continuing ed programs for their learning in the past. Next, I'll discuss some of the most important technological changes facing adult and continuing ed and look at the opportunities this presents and some of the risks involved and finally, I'll close with some reflection of what might be some of the next steps for adult and continuing ed administrators in this new environment. So let's get started. To better understand how adult and continuing education administrators will be affected by technological change, I think it's really important to first review their traditional functions and skills. According to Galbraith, Cisco, and Guglielmino, Adult and continuing ed administrators perform nine important functions, including developing and communicating a philosophy and mission, setting goals and objectives, planning, organizing and structuring, leading, staffing, budgeting, marketing, and evaluation. These are core functions, and how they're done is going to change with technology, but they will all remain important. Similarly, the important skills that adult and continuing ed administrators bring include understanding perspective and purpose, knowing communities, communicating and coordinating, programming, working with groups, utilizing technology, and being a critical thinker. These skills, together with the functions mentioned previously, will need to be practiced in different ways sometimes, but they will always remain important to the ongoing viability of adult and continuing education programs and services. In performing these functions and exercising these skills, adult and continuing ed administrators need to pay careful attention to managing their inputs, including staff, budget, facilities, learning materials, and community knowledge and knowledge of their community. The technological changes described in this presentation could have an impact on, the, on any or all of these resources. Using these resources, they then work toward developing outputs typically courses that can be in a variety of subject areas, the arts, humanities, science, business, technology, and offered in, in a, as a one-time program or maybe a one-hour session, as weekly sessions, or as certificate programs, usually involving the successful completion of several courses. The technological changes described in this presentation will also have a significant impact on the future of adult and continuing ed programming. Perhaps most importantly, though, Inputs are gathered and outputs are created in the pursuit of effective, desired outcomes, including personal development, professional development, and community development. We can see some good examples of adult and continuing ed programming for personal development at the University of Regina. Courses include music, as well as arts, technology, fitness, and history. Adult continuing ed courses have also played an important role in helping individuals develop themselves professionally with courses in technology or business skills, for example. These are some examples of more in-depth professional development programs spanning days or even weeks of learning. Finally, adult continuing ed has traditionally played an important role in connecting learning opportunities back to the community. This is one example from the University of Regina where work with marginalized communities and in partnership with community organizations has been crucial. Although more difficult to fund, community development programs have had a significant impact on improving the lives of community members across Canada and around the world. Because this is so important, let me briefly review the point here. Adult and continuing ed isn't about courses. It's about development. It's about personal development, professional development, and community development. Adult and continuing ed is in the development business, not the courses business or the educational technology business. Despite the huge technological changes that are currently underway, the importance of these outcomes remains exactly the same. Okay, now here's another key point. We know why we do what we're doing because of these important outcomes, but 
Why have students traditionally come to adult and continuing ed programs? What's been their motivation to participate? This is important because technology will have a significant impact on this kind of decision making. First, students came because adult and continuing ed programs offered content they were looking for at prices they could afford in locations they could get to. Whether it was computer classes or music or dance or history or business, adult and continuing ed classes were often the only choice or at least the best among a very few choices. Second, students are often looking for some assistance in how to learn something. Sometimes text-based or audio video instruction is sufficient, but at other times interaction with an instructor or a tutor is wanted. In the context of distance learning, Garrison, Anderson, and Archer refer to this as teacher presence, the active involvement of an instructor or a facilitator or a tutor. Third, some students are also looking for a learning community, others to learn alongside with. The theory of social constructivism emphasizes this as a crucial component in the learning process. And again, in the context of distance learning, Garrison, Anderson, and Archer also refer to this as social presence, the importance of community in learning. Fourth, students are sometimes looking for associated services to help them with their learning, such as academic libraries, study spaces, computer access, or counseling services. Fifth, students are often looking for some form of objective feedback on their learning to help them know when they've attained a level of mastery and when to move on to the next level. Sixth, students often want some kind of public recognition and acknowledgement of their learning. This might be for their own satisfaction or to use as part of advancing their careers. The ability to award certificates and grant officially recognized credit is an important part of adult and con continuing education programs. And finally, adult and continuing ed has been able to rely on the fact that only a limited set of alternatives existed for many students. One alternative is independent study. With this kind of informal learning, content is often limited to books or magazines or video documentaries, which can be expensive to purchase or limited to access through a library. Because it's independent, there's no instruction available besides maybe asking a knowledgeable friend or colleague, and that sometimes works, but sometimes it doesn't. Often there was no learning community, although again, friends or colleagues could sometimes successfully play this role. There's typically no services, evaluation, or accreditation available, and as a result, independent study couldn't always meet the needs of the learner, often making adult continuing education the best alternative. Non-formal learning, through libraries or other organizations, often provides another alternative to adult continuing ed, providing more structure than independent study alone. Library program generally involves some kind of content and access to content, and provides some level of instruction. And typically, these kinds of programs are conducted in groups, which allow for some kind of a community to form. These kinds of programs could provide some services, like access to computers or study space, but not student-specific ones like academic writing support or counseling. As well, these programs rarely involve any kind of evaluation or accreditation. Again, non-formal learning could sometimes meet the needs of students, but often an adult continuing ed program was the best choice. Finally, one other alternative was for students to become involved in formal learning through enrollment in a degree program at a university. This certainly provides content, instruction, community services, uh, evaluation, and accreditation. It was also expensive and time-consuming, can be inflexible and often intimidating, especially for adult learners with wider responsibilities or who've been out of the formal education environment for many years. Adult continuing it continues to provide an important alternative for many adult learners, sometimes acting as a bridge to formal studies. So clearly, between informal, non-formal, and formal learning, adult continuing ed is filling an important gap. But technology is changing everything. It has implications on why students come to adult and continuing ed programs. It has, has implications on how to administer those inputs. It has implications on how to design the outputs. And it has implications on how to achieve the desired outcomes. The three major technological changes I want to discuss now are 
One, the growth of open content. Two, the enhanced opportunities for online collaboration. And three, the decoupling of the different components of education and how these have traditionally been administered. So first, open content is everywhere now. An important early example are the digitized public domain books gathered together on Project Gutenberg. Another example is the growth of open access journals, which require no subscription fees to read. Open textbooks are quickly gaining in prominence. Another important example is crowdsourced content like Wikipedia and YouTube. Wikipedia provides an important starting point for many learning projects, consisting of concise descriptions, citations, and links to relevant materials. YouTube provides millions of user-generated videos, many of which can assist with learning objectives, such as playing an instrument or drywalling your basement. More formally, lectures are being posted to the web, such as the well-known TED Talks, as well as academic conferences and seminars. And of course, the growth of open courses from universities large and small are also providing learners with a wealth of opportunities to watch lectures from their own homes. Examples of this include courses from Berkeley and Stanford and many, many more. And this concept of open courses is expanding to things like peer-to-peer -peer university that lets anyone create as well as take a course, creating a crowdsourced university. So far, we've seen open content, readings, videos, lectures, courses, which is all kind of a one-way expert to novice approach to learning. But technology is also enhancing ways that people can interact online too, either asynchronously or synchronously, vastly expanding the opportunities for more meaningful online learning. Tools like Twitter can let people share ideas and resources rapidly forming the basis of a personal knowledge network. Social bookmarking services like Delicious let people share sites they've discovered, either on their own or through their personal knowledge network. And blogs allow for students to do reflective writing in public to be shared with co-students, instructors, tutors, and the wider world. And these are typically open to comment, allowing for an ongoing conversation. Wikis allow for group collaboration on a document. Tools like Dropbox can be used for easy file sharing between students or students and instructors. And Google Docs allows for cloud-based collaborative documentation creating and editing. Skype has transformed online interaction, allowing for free voice and video communication from anywhere on the internet. And tools like Blackboard's Collaborate, seen here, and Adobe's Connect and others like them, allow for an online synchronous classroom experience unlike anything that was possible before. People can share the video and microphone, conduct ongoing text-based chat, raise their virtual hand, ask a question, respond to a poll, share their desktops, and collaborate on a whiteboard. And of course, the entire session, including all of those interactions, are recorded and available for review or later viewing. The growth of open content and the development of new methods for connecting individuals and groups online has led to the emergence of connectivism as a new learning theory based on the ability for people around the world to connect via technology. And one of the central concepts of connectivism is that the connections are as important as the content, content in terms of learning and development. The third major technological change I wanted to talk about is decoupling. David Wiley describes this as the decentralization of key educational components. Things like content, services, evaluation, accreditation, and social life. Once monopolized by an institution, with one university, for example, providing all of them, these are now coming apart and being decentralized with different groups focusing on one or two of them and a student being free to choose where they get the various components from. As we saw previously with the wealth of open content, adult continuing ed doesn't always have to pay to create new content. Instead, they could build on courses, they could build their courses around existing open content, 
providing the tutoring or other kinds of support or the evaluation and accreditation. And this could have implications for administration around issues of staffing or around budgeting. And this is equally true around services. Using a tool like Open Study, students can form their own study groups online or seek the services of a tutor. OER University is looking for academic volunteers, again, to provide those kinds of instructional support services. And public libraries found in communities everywhere are available to answer reference questions, provide study space, computer access, and of course, print resources, video resources, and much more. And evaluation and even accreditation services are also being decoupled. The Western Governors University in the United States doesn't offer any classes at all. They just do assessments and accreditation. Here in Canada, through institutions like Athabasca University, prior learning assessment recognition is available, allowing you as a student to demonstrate your competencies and to be awarded credit for that. And at the University of the People, the courses are all free and you only pay when you want an assessment and those fees are based on your country of location. This model is also being followed by MIT, which was the leader in open courseware and is now providing um, additional services around assessment and student support for an additional fee. The courses remain the same, but support services cost extra. But moving even beyond academic credit, corporate accreditation is now available through companies like Microsoft or Adobe seen here, where someone can take a course or demonstrate their competence and they'll receive certification from the company that owns the software. Another emerging model is that of open badges. The idea is that upon completion of a learning task, a badge would be awarded based upon some demonstrated competency. Just like a Boy Scout or a Girl Guide, an individual learner could pursue a number of badges to demonstrate their expertise. Eventually, these may become recognized in industry and respected as part of a recruitment process. Even now, when you think of job descriptions that ask for a particular degree or set of credentials, or their equivalent, and maybe one day badges might be a recognized equivalent to a degree. One final element of the educational components that's being decoupled is social life. While of course many students continue to interact face-to-face -face on university campuses, things like Facebook or Warcraft or Second Life are becoming increasingly popular online spaces to make friends or even interact with people that you already know in person. This decoupling has led to the idea of edupunk, where an individual can craft together their own education in the way that works best for them. You could imagine a student wanting to learn about African American history going to the Stanford Open Course and going through the content for that. When they need some support on a reference question, they could go to their public library to ask for that, or even get access to a computer or some quiet study space. Looking for a tutor or another student to ask questions of, they could sign on to open study. Socially, they want to interact with some other students, they might invite them to go hunting for treasure on World of Warcraft. When they want an assessment, they could apply to for a PLAR through Athabasca and demonstrate their competency and receive recognized credit. Each piece of these educational components can come from a different source, or maybe a handful of them come from one source and one or two are selected from elsewhere. But these are selected by the students to best meet their own needs and can result in a recognized competency. So reflecting on all of this technological change, what are the opportunities? For adult continuing education programs. Well, it offers adult continuing ed programs an opportunity to focus on their strengths. If a program has a strong set of content already developed, maybe put it online and share it. Or if its credentials are well respected,
consider doing prior learning assessments for a fee. But also use this as an opportunity to maybe drop things you aren't so good at or don't have the capacity to excel in. If you've got weak course content, maybe drop it, save your money, and use open educational resources instead. Developing partnerships are a key part of this. You don't need to do it all on your own. It's important to find others to collaborate with, adding their strengths to your own strengths. You might be strong in creating content, and they might be strong in doing accreditation. Work together to offer the best services in combination. And you don't have to all be in the same institution. You don't even have to be in the same city or even the same country to work together. One of the reasons students came to us in the past was because we were there. But now, students can come from anywhere, and students can go anywhere. It's important to identify new markets and to expand our understanding of what our community means. Certainly our physical local community in our own town will remain important, but there will be opportunities much more widely available. It's important to be entrepreneurial at this time. But of course it's critically important to stay focused on the outcomes. That personal development, professional development, and community development we talked about at the beginning of the presentation and to think about new ways to achieve those same outcomes using the new technological tools and within the new technological environment we're finding ourselves in today. And just as any change presents opportunities, it also provides us with some risks to be aware of. There's going to be lots of learning to do, lots of professional development internally, and that's going to involve a cost. There's going to need to have support staff that will assist with technological change. There's going to be reworking of existing content, discarding some content, and maybe developing new content. There's going to be the need to learn about our existing communities in new ways, but also to find out about other communities that might be a market for what we do. And we need to think about new ways that we might be able to serve them. All of this is going to require investment and resources, and we're going to need to be able to find those. Another risk is going to be increased competition. Students are going to have more choices than they've ever had before. We're going to face competition from other adult continuing education programs, from other institutions, but we're also going to face competition from some of the emerging services that we uh, briefly discussed previously in this presentation. And if the response to the kinds of technological changes we've been talking about are denial or inactivity in the face of them, the result will be closures in some adult and continuing education programs. The whole environment in which we're operating in is faced with significant technological change, and to ignore it will mean being overwhelmed by it and not being able to meet the outcomes we've identified. And delivering poor outcomes is another risk to this technological change. While there may be opportunity in decoupling all of these elements, it could very well also be true that the parts are weaker than their centralized whole. We need to ensure that there's sufficient investment and clear understanding of the technological changes that are taking place to ensure that we can take advantage of the changes that are upon us. And finally, there's the risk to community development itself as an outcome. Community development has been under threat within adult and continuing education for a long time now, and the kinds of technological changes we've been talking about here can further threaten it. We'll need to ensure that there continues to be a place for community development in the programs and services that we offer. The internet can be a very good place to find out about things on a global scale, but local issues are often more difficult to find out about. I can go on the internet now and find out what's going on in Syria, for example, but it's very hard to find out what ha what's happening in North Central Regina. This is going to be a key role for adult and continuing education experts to ensure that it continues. So where do adult and continuing education administrators go from here? 
Well, I think that it's important to build on the traditional functions and skills that we identified at the beginning of the presentation. Those all remain relevant regardless of the technological changes that are taking place. It's how we perform those functions and how we use those skills that is going to be important. I think it'll be important to take advantage of our history of adaptability and being able to be flexible. I think it'll be important to continue to be student focused. I think it'll be important to remain ethical and to continue to reflect on our ethical behavior. I think that adult and continuing education has always kept the adult learner in mind and I think it's important to continue to do that. And I think it'll be important to keep in mind those that might be left behind in this rush towards a new technological age. I think it'll be important to remember the history of community development within adult continuing education. And I think that in our rush towards competitiveness and entrepreneurialism, we need to remember that important function. I think it will remain important to, fo to stay focused on our outcomes, not just the inputs, not about providing 10 computer courses this term, but about providing professional, personal, and community development. And to be sure that we're applying technological change where it's appropriate. For all of these things, the technology really doesn't change. And I think that if we focus on those core skills and values, the future has lots of potential. Thank you.